My name is Pietra Mello Pittman, co founder of Sisters Grimm. I'm delighted to welcome you all to Global Landscape Singapore by Ella Spira MBE and the Inner Landscapes of Ella by Rebecca Toe. We have a very exciting talk for you this evening. Uh, we are filming and recording tonight's talk, so can I kindly remind you to please turn off your phones or put them on silent now? If you could also try not to um, make too much noise or move around, that would be wonderful. Uh, is there anything else? We're going to hear some wonderful insights into the works themselves and this very special collaboration between these two female artists tonight. And so I'd like to, without further ado, welcome Elise Black, founder of Art Ultra, Ella Spira MBE, and Rebecca Tone. So hello everyone, thank you so much for being here with us. I'm really delighted to really launch this exhibition, open it uh, with Ella Spira and Rebecca Toe. So I'm going to ask a few questions. We're going to have a conversation, Ella, Rebecca and I, and then at the end, we will invite questions from the audience. So get ready you know, with your, with your questions. So first, let me just give a very quick intro of Ella. I think many of you know her really well. Um, and I would say what struck me when I met Ella and continues actually to strike me, if you could say that, um, is how multi-talented she is. She is a music composer. She was nominated for a Grammy in 2016 for her Inala album. She is also a, a theatre produ producer with, uh, with Pietra, sorry. And uh, she's also a visual artist. She's a painter. And that, in fact, she has been a painter all her life. However, it's not until quite recently that she unveiled and started to show her painting, something that she was holding back, and we might explore the reasons why a bit later. So here we are, we're in Singapore for the opening of Global Landscapes Singapore, and I guess what I want to start by asking you, Ella, is Global Landscapes is a series, so could you tell us a little bit about what this series is about, and then reflect about Singapore specifically and the paintings that we see here in the room today. Yeah. Okay, so, um, hi everybody. Um, the, I think, for, for me, landscapes of a country are so kind of important to the identity, the true identity of, of what that country is. You know, it links, links past to present and will link it continue to you know be the link to the future what what i kind of um find myself leaning into even more is how we how we connect the natural landscape with innovation and with modern life you know i'm not in any way shape or form saying let's all give up our nice lifestyle and go and live in tents you know i think we we all have to be kind of real about the life that we lead whilst celebrating and and taking a moment to consider the nature and you know the more kind of conventional landscapes of our countries really and i say our countries because you know pietro and i have traveled to a, a lot of countries with the intention to discover what it what what, what it is about those countries that really makes them those countries, you know, and what, what it is that makes the people of those countries kind of special and unique, and what, what naturally is it, you know, what's special about the light, what's special about what plants grow there, what, what do we need to protect, what do we need to consider, what is it that ultimately kind of makes the people living there the people there. And I think that's what I'm kind of always seeking to explore and experience and sometimes that I suppose um, comes through more of a kind of natural landscape and sometimes that is told through a collaboration with a musician or a photographer in this case um, or 
or experiences in bars, you know. So it's sort of all these, all these layers. And I don't know that I necessarily really knew that that was all going to come into global landscapes when I first started kind of really leaning into what this series, Global Landscapes, was. But it's certainly what it's become, you know, and every piece has has a story of why why that place, what what were the interactions that were going on in that moment and what is it that we wanted to say. You know, as a as an artist myself I don't I'm I'm not really interested in producing work f just for the sake of it. And I'm not really interested in producing work that doesn't say something. You know, and there's I think there's sort of multi layers to to what I want to say and I realize that can be quite muddly sometimes but I think in the end there's there's a big intention and purpose to every single piece that I produce. I'm going to stop you right here and I'm going to ask you to tell us what is the intention and what happened with this painting of the cargo ship Okay, I'm because I think that story needs to be told. <laughs> I'm glad you asked about that because that is that it was an extremely important moment on many many levels. So, actually, Pietra had said to me, "Have you thought about the ships?" And I was like, "I'm not interested in ships. Why would I think about the ships?" But as it turned out, that became something that actually I got totally obsessed with. So it started when I did the painting of Pietra from the Wallage residence in the Infinity Pool overlooking the ships. And I loved that juxtaposition of kind of, you know, luxury lifestyle, but ultimately overlooking the thing that props up Singapore's economy. And again, links past with present and future, which is shipping. You know, and it connects east and west. And it's, it will always do that because of its geographical location. And that to me seems like, well, that is in one way the most one of the most honest things you could kind of say and state about Singapore, confidently, I think. So we then thought that, well, maybe I thought, I really want to get up close to these cargo ships, <laughs> which is always the, you know, the challenge for Pietra, then how does she make that happen? So we hired a, a little boat, and we went out and got right up close to these ships, possibly closer than we were supposed to, but, you know, Rebecca was ready to take, take the hit if we, you know, got stopped by the police. And, <laughs> and uh, we, we took Rebecca out with us and Claire, who is in the room as well, who's a writer who was writing a piece on, on what we were doing with the series of works here. And we went out and it was, uh, you know, it was sunny and we went miles out and right up close to all these incredible, you know, huge brutalist architecture. I know architecture is not the right word, but th of these vessels. And it started to storm and there was fork lightning going on somewhere over there. And then it got closer and the boat starting to go like this. And I've got my canvas out on the front of, you know, on the front of the little boat that we had. And it started to absolutely chuck it down on us. It was that day that was really rainy very recently that just stormed and stormed and stormed. And, you know, we were out for probably three hours in, you know, mostly it being very stormy. And the, what was really interesting for me was how then the rain interacted with the paint. And it just became a part of the painting. And because of the mediums that I use in the sculptural gel, it created this kind of batik type effect. So... Then, I mean, that, that was the beginning of our relationship as well. And I think that that painting means a huge amount to me because of l lots of reasons. What happened, how ultimately it was a bit of a collaboration between me and the rain, I suppose, in terms of the painting itself. And then when it came to also finishing the piece, I finished part of it at the studio. But it, um, I didn't want to interfere with what the rain had done. I felt like I would be, you know, stepping on the toes of nature. So we decided to restretch the canvas. So it's literally been totally reformed, reshaped by what happened there. And I think, you know, for me, that is also what, what separates 
art that can feel a bit contrived if it's too pre-planned and it's everything is there's no sort of fluidity and freedom to allow something to really become what it becomes in the moment so so that was that piece and then of course for me massively importantly was this relationship that started with Rebecca that you know I knew from the moment she walked over to me for whatever reason I could just tell this woman is an artist she's not just a photographer she is an artist and when we looked at the images I turned to Pietro and I was like she's an artist we need to do something here we've got to we've got to like you know get get that out more um, so that was the beginning of this too <laughs> well that's the perfect jumping off point and um, let me introduce now Is it my Rebecca <laughs> <laughs> and um, Rebecca so you're a commercial photographer and you've been professionally working with editorial publications and advertising and big brands and you've done that for over 10 years um, but you have also your own personal projects yes. and originally as I understand you were brought in to document the process of Ella creating Global Landscape Singapore. And you can see some of those amazing shots in the video at the back. I really urge you to look at the video before you leave tonight. And a, something sparked between the two of you. And then, I guess, inner landscapes were born. So take us through what happened and your relationship with Ella and right. inner landscapes. Yeah, so, okay, so I was commissioned actually for like a magazine article actually to shoot like behind the scenes um, photos for this uh, very fateful <laughs> trip out to the storm, right, uh, on the boat. And that was it. It was like a one-off, high-buy kind of relationship, right, <laughs> in a way. Yeah, so, you know, but then like, like Ella said, uh, she, I guess after the, the first day, you know, that we spent together on the boat, you know, she looked at the photos and she was like, this is nice, you know, like, why don't you continue to just follow us um, around Singapore? Because we're going to be here for a while. Why don't you just uh, document, you know, what happens when we're here, right? At first, it was a little bit like that. And then I was like, okay, yeah, why not? You know, I'll do that. And then we started spending time together. And I guess then we realized that, you know, we were talking so much and we realized yeah, maybe, you know, we, we really do click and we connect in a strange way and maybe we can do something more <laughs> strange way. <laughs> Why do you laugh? Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, uh, now you've seen the photos, right? It's called Inner Landscapes of Ella. Uh, it's really a response to what Ella was already doing, global landscapes, right? And, and it really came about because, you know, we were meeting for a few weeks already and then we thought, Ella said, okay, I'm going to do an exhibition and I want you to show uh, your photos as well. And I was like, but I don't want to just show behind the scenes photos, right? Of Ella going to the, to the art shop, buying canvas and, and <laughs> trying to find like wine glasses to, to record, you know. <laughs> I, I thought that there's something more. And then I thought, you know, since I've been connecting with Ella in that way, maybe I can explore Ella. Right? As Ella has been exploring the world, right? So maybe I will be the one to sort of get into this person, understand who is the artist behind all this amazing work. Right? And I think then it became kind of like a dialogue between two creators and then two human beings also, you know? So I think Inner Landscapes evolved in a very organic way like that. Yeah. It, it did, and uh, I've been privileged to see a lot of the photos and the brushes, and you can see some of the contact sheets as well in the, in the entrance to the galleries, and you'll see there's so much more to it. And for me, it was really incredibly insightful how you seem to get under the skin of Ella and, and show her as a, as a person having fun, or sometimes in moments, uh, very private moments, but without any deflection on her part. She's just open and she gives herself to you. And I would say that it seems to me that in that relationship between you and Ella, there was also a different, an artist that came to the fore in you, a different kind of photographer. Did you change the way in which 
you were taking photography when you started doing those more intimate portraits? I don't think so, right? I think like the, the way I shoot is very instinctive, you know, and it's very like, I don't think I can shoot another way. Uh, even as, although as we are speaking, I'm trying to explore a lot of different ways of expression, but in the end, it's still me. But I think there was a different change in mindset because of, you know, in my conversations with Ella, she was like, you know, I think you should, because I am an advertising and commercial photographer, right? So I have clients. So I have always been shooting for clients. I always have a commission and all that. And of course, I do my personal work on the side, right? But then Ella was the one who told me like, I think you're an artist and you should show your work. And therefore, I'm going to open myself up to you and I'm going to let you do whatever you want with me. And I was like, oh my God, this person is crazy. <laughs> like this person is trusting me, right? Like, you know, they always say like when a photographer takes a photo of you, it's stealing your soul. So it was a bit like Ella, like, I'm going to give you my soul, you know. It was very kind of her. So, yeah. And that shines through these images. And I think now I want to come back to you, Ella, um, because this is something very special that you have in all your different the different art forms that you practice. You're always collaborating with people. It, it feels it's accidental, but, but equally it's not. And I think you've had some amazing collaborations in the past through your careers. And I wondered if perhaps you could tell us a little bit more how you work with other artists. I'm thinking about um, Lady Blacksmith Mombasso, with whom you, you created the Inala performance. I'm thinking of DB, with whom you created for 50 for 50. I don't know, pick, pick a story and, and tell us that story because they're, they're just enchanting. So um, I think collaboration has been there from the beginning for me. And it is, I think, you know, I feel like when you find the right collaborators, you're stronger together than you are individually. And that is about, I think, you know, giving each other space to, to both exist. And so therefore you create this kind of new thing together. And Inala was, was very particular because that was, that was about wanting to, I think, help develop a new audience that was bringing together a dance audience and a more traditional theatre audience with a world music audience. And Lady Smith Black Mambazo and very specifically Joseph Shabalala, who was the founder of Lady Smith Black Mambazo, who unfortunately we lost at the beginning of 2020, they... they obviously were, uh, were are immensely well known in world music and and popular music more broadly they they it, it felt like there was a little bit of a kind of block between more traditional dance and traditional theater stages and stages where world music was existing and i didn't like that and i didn't really like the fact that i was feeling like certain art forms were that there wasn't enough diversity or representation of people from African origin. And, and I was desperate to work with Lady Smith Blackman Barzo. So I thought, <laughs> it feels like an opportunity for us to put something to them. And what we achieved with that was so important for so many people, you know, the, and the collaboration continues. We've actually got Adele here right now, and Adele was in the show from the beginning, and Adele is Singaporean. So, you know, there was collaboration beyond sort of solely South Africa and, and Britain as well, you know, it went way beyond. And I mean, that, to, for Joseph to be prepared in his 60s, as someone who is black South African who grew up in apartheid, to be prepared to even consider collaborating with a white young woman, at that point I was 22, that was brave for, of him, massively brave. They'd never collaborated with just the piano either, or they'd never co-written with a woman at that point. And I was 22. I mean, <laughs> we couldn't have been from more sort of different worlds in many ways. But in the end, you know, there was this pure love between us. And my absolute driver and intention was to ultimately bring more diversity into what is considered the dance world. And therefore, you know, also create a new audience, make it more accessible. And we certainly achieved that. And what I love with the narrative of that too is that the collaboration kind of 
continued and evolved to then the young people that we invited in as part of the social impact program that we built in around our shows. And we have now had 8,000 young people benefit from our programs for free. And with that one specifically, it is about diversity and it's about careers education. And it is you know, angled in the UK at people who, young people who, who are um, less privileged, you know, and I mean economically privileged. Um, and that's been massively successful. So I see, you know, this theme of collaboration, it, it is artist to artist, it is, you know, artist to country, it is then also, you know, us with the young people that we engage with as well. And that's, that also then is uh, very, very much sort of what Art and Nature became about too. Well, I think it's a nice way to segue back into the global landscape and nature, the environment, which are very important themes for you. And I think particularly how you work with young people around that and the mental health element. I know you've got big plans coming up to do even more. Do you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, so um, art and nature, kind of, the, really, the landscape paintings that I was doing uh, were a total sort of segue then into art and nature. So through the pandemic, we, we were in the UAE, we were kind of stuck in the UAE, and um, we decided to go and seek out the, the very sort of natural landscapes that most people don't think of when they think about the UAE. Most people living in the UAE don't really engage with it that much. And um, we produced a, a music video which was animating the landscapes that I'd painted around the UAE. On our sort of journey around and, and interaction with people, I was getting quite frustrated, I think it would be fair to say, at, um, at how, how much more people could do around simple things that would protect the environment a bit, just basic things, recycling, awareness of fair trade, just choices around things that they buy. It, I, it, was, it was bothering me. And I think what Pietro and I kind of came to was, is ultimately education. So if we could try to inspire younger people to engage a bit more with the natural environment around them, Firstly, there's the mental health piece, which is massively important. But secondly, maybe it would kind of lead to them making some other choices and being more aware of their environment. So we created Art in Nature, and it's ultimately the first time, really, that we've, we invite young people to actually actively participate in the piece itself. So they create an artwork, we put them all together in a music video, and I co-write the song with somebody from the territory. So in the UAE, it was D.B. Gad, who's my Egyptian Muslim songwriting collaborator there. I'm British and white and Jewish, and you know, so that in itself, like, you know, means a huge amount to both of us, and is quite contradictory for some people, and, and not and brilliant for those of us that are a bit more modern in our thinking, I suppose. And, um, and then we've run that program also in Australia, but ultimately really long term what we want to achieve with that. We just want to get young people thinking about environmental sciences more. And if we could say in 10 years time, oh, look at these new things that exist that are you know, innovations that young people have come up with, that maybe we played a part in helping guide them towards that, then I think we, we would feel extremely proud of ourselves to have played a little part in that. Well, I'd like to ask the two of you this, a couple of questions um, before I open up to you. So start thinking about questions. It's going to be your turn very soon. Um, what is it like to be you? OK, I, I also just want to say something about that line. Um, Rochelle, don't squirm. But I did this uh, interview with Rochelle from the Rob Report, and she's she's a, a youngish new writer. And the first thing she asked me was, "What is it like to be you?" So, and I just thought that was such a brilliant thing for a journalist to ask. And and so then that was how that kind of came to mind when I was putting together the lyrics. When I put together the lyrics for the music video, well, the single that is the music video at the back of the room here, the, uh, everything, I can't, I don't feel I can take credit for the lyrics either because everything was made up of 
conversations I'd had with people, our relationship, Claire, the writer that came out on the boat with us, you know, and then this this chat, I don't even want to just call it an interview, but this very lovely long conversation I'd had with Rochelle. So what is it like to be you kind of came from that interview, but it also seemed to sort of capture, I think, what we're both obsessed with. You know, I'm very much like, I, I want to know what it's like to be Rebecca. I want to know what it's like to be a Singaporean. I want to know what it's like to, to, you know, really get under the skin of what a country is about. And then I, want, I w also want to know what her true artist self is really like. And I, I kind of feel like that's my, that's my almost service to, to this collaboration really is, you know, I'm giving myself to her to want to help her as an artist. And, and then also make sure that we get an international spotlight on her too. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know. I, am I supposed to answer the question? Yes, please. <laughs> is it like to be me? I'm asking questions, you answer. Oh my god, I don't know how to be, I don't know how to answer this question because it wasn't in the list that was given to me. <laughs> I didn't prepare for it. Um, uh, okay, let me think. Um, it's, it's very difficult to know, you know, like we're all interested in how, you know, what is it like to be Ella? Interestingly, it's very in difficult to know what is it like to be us, right? Because I feel like it's so difficult to be awake. Right, most of us are kind of sleepwalking through life and anyway life is very strange right like reality is very mysterious so i think for me like it's an ongoing ongoing journey to understand what is it like to be a human being um, and also what is it like to be a soul and what is it like to be a soul to meet another soul Right? And then also, what is it like when a soul meets another soul and they do something together? So it's just this whole ongoing journey to discover a lot of things. It's, I think uh, I was just listening to a video yesterday, watching a video yesterday, and it was a writer from Chile, and he said, um, mystery is more important than truth. And I think that is life, right? you shouldn't be able to find out everything about yourself. You should be a bit surprised by what you find out. And you should also be a bit surprised by life. So just be open. And I think that's what I love about Ella, because she has taught me a lot about what it means, in the short time that we've known each other, what it means to be open to life. Because Ella is just like fearless, and she's like totally in her element. She's like, let's do an exhibition. <laughs> And two months later, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is an exhibition. Yeah. And she's like, let's go to New York. And then I'm sure we'll go to New York and we'll do something. You know, she's just at ease with life. She's at ease with herself. And she's at ease with creating. And she's at ease with letting people see what she has created. And I think I've learned a lot, really, about what it is to be Ella. And I hope to, you know, continue to learn a bit more. Yeah, that's wonderful words from from Thank both you. of you. Unprepared, so, unprepared, unprepared. <laughs> you see, you can do it. I told you I was going to go off script, so there you go. Um, now let me turn to the audience. Any questions for Ella or Rebecca? Yes, we have a question at the back. Everything's changing all the time. What keeps you guys grounded in the purity of your creativity? And, and Rebecca, you just said something about the continued mission of mystery and unlocking keys in life and things. How do you guys stay rooted to your original messages that you want to be portraying in your art? That is a, okay, that is a really good question. Um, I think, okay, I, I have a sort of a few fundamental things that for me are, I guess, kind of pillars. and. One is the the just a completely obsessive, all-consuming desire to want to create more equality and get get be done with segregation and try to try to kind of do things that is 
is not just talking about, but is doing the thing of bringing people from different cultures and different backgrounds and different diversities and different abilities, you know, all, all those things together, you know, and I think that that grounds me always because that isn't something that you can do on Instagram or Twitter. I don't, I, do you know what? I shouldn't even talk about that stuff because I'm the person that thinks that being on WhatsApp is doing social media, so I am not someone to comment on social media, but... <laughs> But it's that I think the that is something that always grounds me, and I think you know whatever else is going on, that is also that is something that is so that relationship between people is is so intrinsic to to humans, and you know through all the stuff that people get a bit preoccupied with that's to do with status and money and having things, and you know in the end that experience of like sitting with somebody who's from a different culture and being like we're equal, you know we are equal, we come from different places, but we're look we're all the same flesh and blood, and in the end fundamentally we've all got the same stuff. So I think that, and that also feeds I think mental mental health for for me as well. You know mental health is massively important and I think there are various things that ultimately support mental health and you know people interaction with people is one of them for me creating work is a massive thing nature and you know also nature doesn't care what what you've got on nature doesn't care what car you drive it's you know it's never gonna and so that I think strips away all of that nonsense too um, and that's not, you know, I'm not being, uh, again, I'm not being all sort of damning on the luxury lifestyle that we all lead. But I do, I do feel like the, the grounding things will always be there and are always available to people. It's just, you know, whether you're kind of prepared to go and look for them. We had this really lovely thing with Australia Art in Nature. We had even more kind of diversity come through in the applications or submissions rather and um, we had a child, I thought this was a really good example of something that actually is very grounding and what kind of a you know, nature-based project that is ultimately about you know, an art and music project. It, this lad is nine, he was blind, is blind, and he did a, a painting of a rainforest. So his teachers helped him. But it was, you know, he was born blind. It's what he imagines a rainforest to be. It was a really gorgeous piece of work. And they helped him pick out the leaves. And they helped him kind of do the outline. And it's just, it's so humbling. And that's what I think music and art can do. That's what the arts are there to do. But it's also ultimately then, you know, the way that we tell the stories and the way that we make it accessible for everybody. I think those are the those are some examples of how how I and Pietra and I we stay grounded. I think. I think. How about you? Yeah, I think my answer is the same, um, but in different words, maybe. Right? It's love in the end, um, self love, love for yourself, and love for the world and other people. Because I think um, we live in a very noisy world. It's just uh, a lot, a lot is going on. So. I think it's just a daily, um, a daily struggle to remember to love yourself. But then once you remember to love yourself and to love the people around you, everything is reset again. And that's all we need, actually. Yeah. I think also to, to add to that, I would say that, you know, Pietro and I have had, uh, we've had a lot of different interactions and relationships with people in lots of different countries and lots of different kind of socioeconomic situations and, and, and cultural reference points. And I think one of the other things that certainly kind of grounds me is, is the ongoing relationship that we have with them. You know, and when you kind of have that, you sort of know you've touched, that you, you, know, you've, you, you know, two people have kind of touched each other's lives and that you've supported each other in some way and that you're kind of, maybe your life is better because, because, of, those, because of those things. You know, there, there are people who are in the Amazon, who are locals in the Amazon that we spent time with, who get in touch with us, got in touch with us through the pandemic, you know, and those things you sort of think, oh, they're there with, with the pink dolphins and with all the flying fish and all the stuff that, you know, we kind of, is so out of reach for us in one way, but isn't because we now got this relationship with them and we've got this contact with them. And, and you know, in the end, if you we weren't being, if you weren't approaching those places with open arms and as a friend, 
it would be very transient and you wouldn't have any ongoing kind of relationship with any of those people. Well, I think uh, this conversation is now drawing to a close. So um, the exhibition is on uh, until Friday and please, uh, Saturday. <laughs> Uh, to well be done, honest, everyone. I have no idea which day we are. I'm still <laughs> jet lagged, so we might as well be Tuesday. Don't know. Anyway, so it is Saturday, so please come back and visit it and, and bring people. All the artwork, the photographs, uh, the arts from, uh, from Ella, they're all for sale. So if you're interested, please uh, take a, a, a little uh, leaflet and get in touch with us. Um, Global Landscapes is moving on. We're going to be in New York, I believe, in a couple of months. So do come and see us there if, you, if you're there. Stay in touch um, so that we can keep you informed of all our fabulous plans. And with this, um, I'm really, I just want to say thank you to Ella for sharing all of her super exciting experience and really uplifting. Here's someone who's trying to change the world and she's doing it. And she has no fear, she has none of these personal barriers or anxieties about, oh, but what if I fail and what if it doesn't work? I don't, I don't think the thought even occurs to her. But here we are, you know, in, in Singapore with this beautiful exhibition and with this encounter with Rebecca who has really managed to capture something quite magical about Ella through these, through these photographs. So thank you, both of you, and thank you all for being here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.